I'm Stephanie Wilson Coleman, the Empowerment Doctor. I believe that each soul is jam-packed with every single thing that it needs to be successful. I believe that no matter where you find yourself, that you can overcome. I believe that you have what it takes deep inside you to be a winner. See, it's not over until you say it's over. Get ready for this adventure, for this adventure towards success. Dream big. Tomorrow's gonna bring a change. The message remains the same. Greetings and welcome to A Sip of Inspiration. I'm Stephanie Wilson Coleman, the Empowerment Doctor, and I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to tune in to my show tonight. As always, I promise it will be exciting, enlightening, and informative. And as you know, this is a call-in show and the number will appear at the bottom of the screen. So I encourage you to get your pen and your paper right now. Tonight's topic is one that is near and dear to my heart. It's homelessness. And for those of you who have been following me a while, know that in the late 90s, I experienced temporary homelessness. That experience taught me a lot of things. And one of them is that there are a lot of reasons people end up homeless, not all for the reasons we think they are. So tonight, joining me to have a very powerful discussion are two people in the community whose life's purpose has to been has been to help people like me who have been homeless to get back on their feet so that they can live the life that they've imagined. I'm going to start with my guest, Reverend Dr. Sanjay Stinson. Thank you very much. And before I tell you a little bit about Dr. Sanjay Stinson, I want you to send, oh, can't talk. <laughs> I gave her a call when I was looking for to put the panel together. And I said, okay, I was on the website looking around and uh, it says, I know a little bit about the Matthew House and I wonder if she could work me into her schedule, right? Just so, and I said, so I go through this thing and I says, well, you know, the worst she can say is no and no one ever died from no and I can keep going, but I really want her, right? So lo and behold, she answered the phone and she said yes. So here she is, and I want to tell you a little bit about her. She's the founding executive director of the Matthew House, which is a supportive services center for the homeless that is now 21 years old. She employs 18 staff members in Chicago. She's a member of Christian Community Development Organization, Women on the Front Line, Faith International Covenant of Churches, and serves on various nonprofit boards. She has taught and preached the Word of God at workshops, conferences, and revivals. Now, the Matthew House is nonprofit, so I want you guys to know that, meaning they need donations, time, food, every single thing, influence that you have to offer. Nonprofit means they have to make it on their own and find their own funding. So I don't want you to think that there's a rich Rockefeller sitting back there. Of course, if there are any Rockefellers available who would like to support them, we'll gladly take that, okay? <laughs> uh, it's located at 3722 South Indiana, and she is one of the few facilities who handle men, women, and children. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, sitting next to her is David Pendleton. I, too, made a call to the Door of Hope and was hoping to find somebody, and they says, oh, Mr. Pendleton is the guy. So I called several times. He was on his way, 20 minutes. <laughs> Evidently, his 20 minutes was a little longer than my 20 minutes, right? <laughs> but he did get there, and I talked to him, and he, too, said yes. So I thought that is absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to tell you all a little bit about him, too. He is also nonprofit, so that means checkbooks, volunteerism, influence, every single thing, they can use your help. David Pendleton is currently the executive director of the Door of Hope Rescue Mission. After serving on the board of directors for five years, he felt the move of Christ to facilitate the forward progress of the mission. In his time, the mission has made great strides in transitional living and men returning to the rightful place in society. The highlight of this accomplishment is developing a community approach to ministry within and forming a residential environment 
that also that allows less enabling and more prosperity. He also is located in Chicago, 53rd and in South Indiana, That's correct? Right. That's right. Yeah. So they're not too far from each other, and they're in key places in the neighborhood. So I want to start the conversation off with breaking some of the stereotypes, mm. what homelessness is not. People have this misconception that um, homeless people got there because they're either all losers or whatever. And when I was homeless, I remember um, hearing the lady saying, well, you know, you can't, I was in a store, you can't give them any money because all they're going to do is drink. And <laughs> I said before I knew it, honey, if you were homeless, a drink might help you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, so let's break that that myth what is homelessness and what is not well if I would define homelessness um, today um, the basis of homelessness has changed mm -hmm. not everyone that becomes homeless is homeless because of drugs or alcohol or because that they have a mental challenge or, or things of that nature many people are homeless because of the economic conditions of our society right now and so uh, the many faces of homelessness include both men, women, and children, and families who have lost their homes due to foreclosures or um, owners that have went into foreclosures um, and have become homeless because their income has not been able to sustain them to find a unit. Mm -hmm. So we have to get out uh, away from homeless, the skid row homeless that many of us may have been familiar with. That was all individuals who were on alcohol or drugs and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to look at homelessness a different, in a different light. I agree, and taking it in another direction, uh, with a little bit more compassion from the inner side, mm -hmm. I think people need to change the word homeless to houseless. Okay. Uh, in our environment, this is their home. Door of Hope is their home. Their mail comes there, they live there, they shower there, eat there, fellowship there, leave from there to go to work, they leave their property there, return, their property is still sa safe. Uh, but put yourself in their shoes. Before you lost your home, before you lost your house, you actually lost your home. You were already gone before you walked out of the door the last time. And it's a dysfunction with relatives that allowed you not to have another place to go. It's a dysfunction with finances that allowed you not to have mm -hmm. another place to go. That's where your home is based, in your finance and in mm -hmm. your relationships. So once you lose your house, that's totally different. These men have lost housing, and that's what we're trying to get them back into. In the meantime, the dignity of having a home is not lost on the door of hope. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and adding to that, I think that's, that's so true, uh, David, because I think that also what happens is that when we become homeless and have lost our house or lost a home, sometimes we can stay with a relative for a little time or a little while, but that, that also gets hold. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, and, you're, you're right and about that. that. I old. think mm -hmm. I, yeah, I had a friend and I <coughs> stayed probably four weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets old real fast. Mm -hmm. Get off my couch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does, yeah. and and it's uh, and the financing part, which mm -hmm. was what played key to me, and divorce. Right. A lot of women are uh, the saying used to be that you're a divorce away from homelessness, right. or two paychecks away from homelessness. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the issue too. Mm -hmm. And then if you have the break in the economy that we had, mm -hmm. I'm am, I'm just probably amazed that there are not more people. And then uh, we know that it, uh, emotional and mental illnesses play a part in it also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anymore, it's like a small part of it is alcoholism and drug addiction. Yes. Before, yes. Like you said, before yes. it used to be all, but now that's just a small part. That's just a real small part of what, hum what the faces of homelessness look like at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to be very careful how we categorize and how we define homeless. In the two thousand in the twenty first century, mm -hmm. because it's not just the individual who um, has been abused or abused by drugs, but it is everyone that is experiencing some hardships mm -hmm. that will cause homelessness. Now, I saw a video one night watching the news um, about homeless and invisible that really touched me, because uh, I work in the downtown area and you see people just sort of, you know, they're talking to each other, ha 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 ha, and then there's somebody homeless, and then it's like, oh. I don't see them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's awful because we don't 
fight to correct what we don't allow ourselves to see or what we don't allow ourselves to experience. So if we could see it, then maybe we could help uh, get moved le legislation mm -hmm. that will allow us to actually address the problem a little better. So if that video is ready, I'd like to have the control room run that video. My sister and her family have lived in New York for like eight years now. She took care of me when I was a little kid because my parents were working. Every Sunday I cook, and so my uncle calls me and um, he'll be like, hey, what you making? Nobody meets in bars anymore, but I, I met my wife in a bar and, uh, you know, 34 years later, still working. <laughs> My grandma had a lot of costumes from the theater that she started. When we were kids, we'd dress up in those costumes and we'd put on little sketches for the family. In my whole life, I've always felt like we were like a team, my brother and I. I think there's nobody who can understand you quite like your family. That's my cousin. That's really weird. I know she's not homeless because I just hung out with her a couple weeks ago but I mean it's I did not know that that person walking when I was walking by it was her <laughs> it's you know and things are a lot more real than you expect so that video I saw that and I it just tore my heart to pieces because I see that kind of behavior every single day and it's like we treat people who have a soul who have a breath of life in them as if they're strangers so how do we change that creating a hostile environment to begin with um, I would I would challenge a person just to name half of their neighbors on their block. If you're not in touch with your family and you're not in touch with the people that inhabit the same community as you, how are you going to show compassion for a person who has nothing? I, I think love is lost on a lot of us. Um, and my only thing to say is we don't need a meeting, we don't need a march. 
start with yourself. Examine how you love and um, make that difference with yourself. Don't concern yourself so much with everybody else, but get out there and, 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 and examine yourself and, and show that you have failed the test and you need to uh, enhance your presence in this community and, and show the love to somebody you don't know. I think that I agree with David to the point that when we were growing up, we had extended families. And as he said, everyone on the block took care of everyone's children. Mm -hmm. And so we knew each other. We cared about mm -hmm. each other. We watched out for each other. Um, the grandmothers and the great mother, grandmothers were able to discipline um, the children. So <coughs> I think um, w the answer is, again, is to get back to the basic of what the Bible says, is that of all three, love is what we need to get back to. Right. Love is the greatest thing. It's the greatest thing. And I think we've lost our first love, and that love is for people, and the care of people, and how uh, we treat each other. Mm -hmm. I know that um, you talk to people who have this emptiness inside. You, I mean, you, if you read Facebook, there's an emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. um, you listen to the uh, reality shows, there's an emptiness and mm -hmm. everyone's trying to fill it and then you run the game of, of um, money and things, houses mm -hmm. and cars and as a matter of fact I joke with my husband that all you hear on the radio now is what I have, what I drink and who I do, you mm -hmm. know. And, but still, after all of that, there's still this emptiness. So what I hear you all saying is that that emptiness is the failure to learn to love the, even yourself first. Because right. if you don't love yourself, right. you, can't, you can't love anyone else. Right. And then when you start to embrace others, that emptiness I found in my own life, it fills that place up. It builds a community. Mm -hmm. the, the, the word, word within community is unit. Uh, some people don't know they're dead, and, and that's just that simple. Um, I heard something earlier today that uh, was profound. I might, might say it later on, but I think that if we uh, look at the ills that we want to conquer and conquest, I think the greatest ill is the refusal to examine itself. Um, I, I walk past a person who is on the street with nothing, I see them. It's not that they're not there, but I can throw a dollar in the cup, but when's the last time somebody actually stopped and had a conversation? When I came to Door of Hope, I looked at the place, I said, well, this is filthy. Uh, we need to do something here. And one thing we had to do, we had to clean the place up. We had mm -hmm. to clean it up physically, we had to clean it up mentally, we mm -hmm. had to clean it up spiritually. Mm -hmm. you, you're familiar. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and it changed the environment completely. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you, 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 if I had to live there, mm -hmm. what would I want? Do I want less for these men than I want for myself? Then I need to leave ministry. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing, um, Reverend David has been there, Matthew House prides itself on cleanliness. So our bathrooms are clean, our kitchen is clean. We serve two hot meals a day. Mm -hmm. um, we ensure <coughs> that the men have clean towers and, and everything that they need in order to sh um, shave and shower and clothes that are given, that the clothes that they want. And, and they have a full service case management, but I agree with uh, Reverend David that you, you really have to have clean if what you want to live here. And so it's very, very important that we as a, in the, yeah. as a, as an individual say what well, I want to live here. And he knows that I've experienced some of the issues that he said about the door of hope. And yes. you have to really challenge yourself. And I think, I think society just wants to say, well, we just give them anything. But the homeless pe individuals want to be treated like you would want to be treated. They want to live like you would want to live. There's another element that's missing that okay. I maybe don't know. We're exactly two miles from each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say 60, 70 percent of the population of the mission goes to Matthew House. Mm -hmm. One thing we're not trying to do is repeat the services. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Okay. But it's a community that is extended mm -hmm. because they go there for particular reasons and they return to the mission for particular reasons. Uh, but they're con they consider themselves family. Yes. Um, 
And, and, and what's good about that is it has uh, created a fellowship that most people don't enjoy. Most people go home mm -hmm. by themselves or to themselves, even around other people. These men play dominoes, do whatever they're going to do, mm -hmm. but they have some fullness mm -hmm. in the face of adversity. Mm -hmm. And, and I live in the community, and I have lived in the community, so they can see me walking any time. Hi, Rev, hi, Doc, or, or mm -hmm. whatever they want to call me at a time. And if there's an issue with Door Hope, David will come down, or we'll try to work it out. Um, they, they, they have a fellowship. They have a family. They watch out for each other. And mm -hmm. when new ones, if there is some new ones that do come, become homeless, we, as a family, being too mouthy, to say, okay, look out for um, this one because he doesn't know the trail. We call it the trail. Mm -hmm. okay. So many of them are on the trail and and before the Matthew houses and the door of hope is many of them will walk two to five miles just to get a decent meal or just to get supported services, just to be able to make a phone call, mm -hmm. to be able to get their mail. I mean there are a lot of places that their mail can come but the the question is, is can you pick it up? Is it really going to be safe there? Is it really, can you really pick it up? Can you really answer that through a phone call? Or are you going to be turned away because of who you are and mm -hmm. what, what you are experiencing as, at that particular time? Mm -hmm. Are you less than? <coughs> are mm -hmm. you less than? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got a caller. Uh, we're going to take this call, and then after this, uh, there's another video that I want to yeah, show you true. that was actually Maybe shot in Chicago. Shoe. On the other shoe. The, uh, like the politicians and other people got the, all this rich money. If they were homeless, it would have been on other foot. And y'all doing a good job. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, there's another video that we found that actually highlights homelessness in Chicago mm -hmm. during this polar vortex that we're calling. Oh. And we'll get after this video, we'll talk about how that affected the services at your organizations. What's your name, sir? My name is Clifton. Uh, and Clifton I, Johnson. And you're out here on the street in Chicago. It's pretty cold. What are you going to do tonight? Oh, man. The only thing I can do is just shake my cup and ask somebody if they be good to me and help me with a blessing. Have, so, you, have you got somewhere warm to stay? No, sir. I don't have nowhere warm to stay. I got around the corner. I got a little spot from the mm -hmm. store where the heat come out of the vestibule, mm -hmm. and I go in there and the Nice you people that gave me a couple of warm blankets. Mm -hmm. And I put the blankets around me and I stay around there tonight. That'll be tonight. And then what about, I mean, the, the temperature's going to drop a lot more. What are you going to do late tonight and tomorrow? If I could get uh, some coffee or something, and then, then I get on the train. I walk on the train and get on the train and stay there and just ride from one mm -hmm. end to the other end. That'll be a blessing to me. And, and the people are okay leaving you on the train? Yeah, they don't mind. If you go to one end and the other end, maybe twice, then they won't say nothing. CTA won't say nothing. It'll be a blessing. How long have you been out on the street? I've been out here for three years. Is there any hope the city can give you? Well, the city is, they, they kind of occupied. They can give me a little help if they really, really wanted to, you know. But they so tied up and they so occupied into all the other big time stuff. Whereas the homeless people, they really don't want to help the homeless people. And if you, so, you know? you've done you've done other winters out on the street like this before? Oh uh, yes, I have. I spent three years. I spent three years out here. What happened? The first time, the first time that I got out here, the reason why I'm out here because my wife was in an accident, and uh, she lost her life in there, and then I ended up losing my job at Rodney and Renshaw, a uh, trusted loan company, about three years ago. And then when I lost my job, I lost the, uh, the consent of uh, the custody of my uh, daughter. And then when I lost the custody of my daughter, that made me go into a depression stage, and I lost everything that I had because I had to go to the hospital, and I spent six months in the hospital. So you've done three winters out on the street? Almost three. Almost. This this, be, this the third one here. And you're not thinking of trying to get into a shelter? Uh, I'd have been to a shelter before. The one thing that struck me about the video is mm -hmm. the hardships that he talked about. Mm -hmm. He lost his wife, mm -hmm. which usually in most families that's an income. Mm -hmm. In the two, he lost a whole income, mm -hmm. and in some cases that may have been the only income. Yes. Yeah. 
Then he lost custody of his child, yes. which is the next thing that would have connected him to the sense of self, the sense of worth, the sense of love. Mm -hmm. And with that, it's no wonder he couldn't find the energy or the strength from somewhere to keep going on. Mm -hmm. And then work does suffer in the middle of tragedies like mm -hmm. that. You know, we all like to think that we could like go and do 100%, but that's not possible. So do you see a lot of this in the families and in the uh, men that you deal with? Um, I would say yes. I would say that many, um, as I said, the faces of homelessness in the 20 plus years that I've been in homeless, mm -hmm. Uh, working in the homeless arena is that their faces have changed. There is a loss of sometime family, a loss of jobs, a loss of um, 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 sense of self, uh, mm -hmm. and then there is a depression, and, the, and the, you know they go into depression, and the, the family does not want to help them, so they end up um, on the street. But as David and I was watching the video, a lot of them um, won't come in. Also, right? <coughs> why is them, why is that? Money. Uh, money. Money. They, 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 they can create an income, a flow of income, holding a cup, okay. as opposed to coming into a shelter which doesn't pay you. Uh, you know, you got your hustle, you got to get on, you, you got your substance you have to uh, apply yourself to. Right. Uh, but what, was, what I saw in him was typical, man without men around him in mm -hmm. times of trouble. See, we can get each other into trouble, but we can't get each other out of trouble. This is where our society is breaking down, and men are not rallying around men in times of sorrow and trouble. This man lost his wife. She was in an accident. This was sudden. Mm -hmm. Depression is definitely going to be. I've mm -hmm. seen men come into the mission who have lost their wives. Mm -hmm. I've got two right now that are dear to me. And having lost their wives, uh, you know, this is good that they're around this many men to help build them back up because nothing can take her place. Mm -hmm. And that's where the depression comes from, and it might lead to drug use. And I'm gonna give Christ a bid here. Mm -hmm. Without Jesus, mm -hmm. all is lost. Right. So, you know, these men come into a saving faith. And as the, what I was, the quote I was gonna say earlier, you save the soul, but don't save the mind, you lose them both. Right. And if, if these men are not put into situations where other men are continuing, continuing to keep them built up, they can go right back into the mm -hmm. same thing. We, and that's what helps our society to thrive. We, become, we respect women better when we have a, a deeper understanding of the relationship with other brothers. And I think that one of the things that I've learned with the homeless population is they have great survival skills. Yes. They know how to survive. They know all of the spots. They know exactly where to go. Um, <coughs> they're past the cup and do whatever it is that they need to do to survive. But the, the avoidance of coming in a lot of times is how they've been treated in shelters. Yes. Okay. And how they've been mistreated in shelters. And because they're treated as if they're, they don't have a sense of purpose. And so a lot of them would rather stay on the street or as he says, under a store where the heat is coming down or in abandoned buildings um, because they have a sense of purpose. And they don't not, especially men, are not gonna let you mistreat them and take their manhood away. Right, right. And so you have to be very careful when you're serving men that you allow them to make those decisions themselves. And Dr. <coughs> Stinson is absolutely correct because there you have a, a rebellion against authority mm -hmm. that is profound. Okay. And when, uh, you, know, you, you don't wanna be told what to do. And sometimes rules within environments such as this, one, are usually overbearing, and two, are administered by somebody who's almost just like you and tends to be obnoxious. So you don't want to be in that environment. You'd rather be on the street than be treated as less than a man. Or a woman. Yes, uh, yes, or absolutely. Mean, or a woman, yes. I mean, right. because yes. we, Matthew House is seeing about, or well, we started off with men, Matthew House is now seeing about uh, 15 to 25 percent of females with families mm -hmm. or females who's on the street and they have the same issues. They, uh, they don't want to be treated um, lesser. I am homeless but treat me like a human being. 
Thank and you. that that is what um, the population suffers. And then what also happens in this population is that we want to give them anything, whereas they deserve a good hot meal, they deserve a bath, they deserve clean clothing, they deserve clean sheets just as when you go home. And as David has said, many of the people that we have on our service desk have at one time been homeless. And so they have lost a sense of sensibility that you were once on the other side of the desk. That's right. Now, when people, people like to help, mm -hmm. so how can people help? And what are some of the things people should avoid doing? My, my, my main mm -hmm. thing would always say, give of your abundance. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of people want to give their trash to mm -hmm. shelter. They give food that's been picked over, mm -hmm. outdated food that's been sitting in their freezer. Oh, don't throw that away, give it to the shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, clothes that are dirty. Mm -hmm. uh, bed bug infested. Mm -hmm. Oh, give it to the shelter. You don't want mm -hmm. that anymore. Give it to, mm -hmm. You know what? Give out of your abundance. Give the things that you know you would want. Mm -hmm. Because that honors God. And it should make you feel better about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're doing this for a tax write-off. And there's a selfish reason behind it in some cases. Mm -hmm. But the ones that truly love people, um, mm -hmm. I, those are the ones I'm not talking to. Pray for us. Mm -hmm. Write a check. Mm -hmm. Continue doing what you're doing. Okay. In the educational part of things, I would strongly suggest examine yourself and think about how you want to give. Mm -hmm. Some things you need to uh, unburden yourself with anyway, and you just need to take them straight out to the trash. Mm -hmm. And then out of what's left, there's still some things you need to part with because they're actually a burden to you. They're actually holding you down. So those things, mm -hmm. find a nice home for. Mm -hmm. Find a nice home for a nice things. Give uh, food. Go to the store. Um, develop partnerships with some of your neighbors. Become a receivership mm -hmm. person that can bring something from Whole Foods or something. Do the do the trip. You know, uh, uh, establish on your block club a ministry mm -hmm. that uh, once a month says that we want to get together and just three of us. Let's mm -hmm. just get together and and uh, find out what we can do. Go in, feel the environment, mm -hmm. feel the necessity. Then make a decision, mm -hmm. okay. not make a decision, go in and okay. create an environment that is, in your, is right. a product of your own mind. Right. So you know, treat people like you want to be treated. I think that uh, Dave is right, but I think one of the key things that just get involved. Yes. Just get involved. I mean, there, you can volunteer. You can um, give money. If we always need money, okay? Yes. So you can get involved. You can sit on a board committee, sit, sit, you know, be, in, be involved in the community and say, what can I do? Uh, a lot of church groups that Matthew House um, houses because they come in because they want to be involved. But as, as David has said that, you know, we, we don't want to, we, don't, we appreciate you, but don't bring the trash. I mean, him and I both have thrown out clothes because they are bed bug infect, infected. Mm -hmm. We can't take them in because um, we, it then infects the whole um, facility and then it causes each of us, which Thousands. is not in our budget, to begin to treat that. And so right. um, don't just bring us things that you don't want or they have, they're dirty, or, uh, they're not fit for a human being to wear. It, it, ask yourself the question, would I wear this again? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so that's a perf So for those of us who've outgrown things are in perfectly good shape. Mm -hmm. Yes, bring them. Bring them. Mm -hmm. Clean them first. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And bring, bring them. Take them to right. the cleaners and clean them. Right. Clean them right. first. Because you don't want to, you do not want to trans, you can right. transmit, oh God, not only bed bugs, but diseases anything. Mm -hmm. and anything yeah. mm -hmm. to a population of people who cannot react quickly. And by the time you react, it has infected your entire population. Right. Mm -hmm. I ran across some startling facts uh, for Chicago. In Chicago, there are approximately 94,000 homeless in the course of one year with an average of 14,000 per mm -hmm. night. In Chicago in 2012, the makeup of the people who were considered homeless, 13% were employed but homeless, 8% okay. were veterans, 6% mm -hmm. HIV positive, 26% mm -hmm. severely mentally ill, mm -hmm. and 33% were domestic violence victims. Mm -hmm. 15% are physically disabled. Yes. 
This is a lot of different things to deal with in your small communities. Mm -hmm. They're difficult to deal with in the workplace. How mm -hmm. do you, that has plenty of funding and insurance and help, how do you deal with that? Well, um, those numbers are right because I work very closely with those numbers and um, you deal with them one person at a time. Yes. One issue, one person at a time. You try to help that individual because <clears throat> there is a pleasure of things that you can do for the community, but when you come to me as a homeless individual, you need my attention because you're hurt, you've been outcast, um, you're in need, mm -hmm. and so <coughs> you have to try to help them one person at a time. And each night when I lay down, and I'm sure David, have I given anything today? Have I helped some needed soul along the way? I would also say that um, I, I put a title on people that we work with, and that was anyone who's listening and viewing us. Uh, you are our transformation partners. I consider you a partner in this. Mm -hmm. I consider the men at the mission a partner. I consider mm -hmm. Dr. Stinson a partner. I consider you a partner. If we look at ourselves as partners, there's an expectation Mm -hmm. But there's also a level of trust that we have to have for one another that have to help us bring each other up mm -hmm. to a, even a higher level of giving because it's all about giving. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you're dealing with people who are going through a traumatic situation, homelessness is traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Oh, all of, those, all of those groups desperate. are suffering trauma. Mm -hmm. They're desperate. Mm -hmm. They're, they are desperate. You're dealing with a desperate situation. And afraid. Yes. They're desperate and afraid. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But they're not stupid. Right. And the main thing you got to do is you have to bring the truth because mm -hmm. the truth in love will conquer so much more mm -hmm. than pretense. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that um, when you look at it, you know, because I deal with mostly men, mm -hmm. you know, you'll probably have to answer the rest of this for mm -hmm. me. Uh, when, when, you, when you look at a man who uh, basically needs at 40 years old or 50 years old job training mm -hmm. and has basically had most of his life outside of uh, any decent prospect. Mm -hmm. He's looking for day labor. Day labor is abusive. You pay somebody 30 bucks for, you were saying back in January during the harsh winter, mm -hmm. they're out there holding signs for Sears. Mm -hmm. Sears, but it's a subcontractor that gets them to hold the signs. Okay. He's paying them nothing. Right. And okay. they have to pay their own transportation. Right. They are abused. Mm -hmm. you, you, you take the dignity away from work mm -hmm. when you treat a person in such a manner. And <clears throat> I think at Matthew Health, because we do do life skills, computer training, housing, um, and our case managers and staff is very aware, I, I will not allow any vendor to come in and abuse our population. Because as David has said, you give them $10 to stand out there all day. You don't feed them. You, they have to stand there. And you expect them to stand there. If they don't stand there, then you're, you're, you're using foul language uh, at them. And I've heard it because I've been there mm -hmm. um, saying that, you know, and calling them outside of their name, downgrading them because they are homeless. Right. So we have to be very, very, very careful when we do that. And then we have to, when you say, what can you do? How do you treat them? You treat them like you would want to be treated. Absolutely. Simple as that. If you want, you don't want to be treated that way, why treat another human exactly. being? Because they're down on their luck or whatever you want to call it. Why treat them any different? Mm -hmm. Treat them like God would treat them. Exactly. Ooh. The least you do for my little ones, you do it unto me. Be careful. You might be entertaining a stranger. That's right. We have a caller an on angel, the line. An angel, I'm sorry. An, an angel, angel, right. right. Mm -hmm. We have a caller on the line. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Wonderful. You have a question for our panel? Yes, I do. It, I, I love your show. I wanted to say that. But I, the, this topic is amazing because I have a great nephew. He's nine. And he just asked me the question on Saturday, why are there homeless people? Mm -hmm. And he also wanted to know where did it start? That's a question that I couldn't answer. And I was wondering where does it start and how do you put value back into a person? 
person that has been it has been taken away. Well, I think as I said earlier, um, caller, you begin with one person at a time. You begin to love them, as David and I have said. You begin to treat them like you would want to be treated. That's the first step. You open and you give them a welcome mat and let them know that it's going to be okay mm -hmm. and that I'm here or we're here to help you and to help you um, take back and reclaim control over your life. So I think that you would start there. And where did homelessness start? I would have to go back to the biblical days because I think about um, the Samaritan that was on the road and many people um, passed him and the Levites and the priests and everyone passed him by and a stranger came and took him and says, whatever it costs, take care of him and when I come back this journey, I will repay you. So that's how come Matthew House's motto is, I was a stranger and you took me in. I don't know, David. I would say that homelessness, I would probably have to get biblical too, because <coughs> my history only goes back that far, mm -hmm. you know, with any legitimacy. Um, pretty much uh, when uh, people started to rebel, mm -hmm. you, you see the spread of homes was naming a country after yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but as people became slovenly, mm -hmm. they didn't care where they lived. Um, mm -hmm. The housing situation as we know it is nothing like the housing situation of ancient times. So let me bring it into current day relevance. Mm -hmm. People are homeless today because the economic situation has shifted away from self-sufficiency mm -hmm. and has shifted away from empowerment and it has shifted away from interdependence. Mm -hmm. And because we don't have these things working, these things working with us, especially when you're not in the upper middle class. Um, is there still well, middle, middle class? Well, the middle class, it's defined in the middle class now is very difficult. Well, that's why I kind of skipped right. over. That's right. why I skipped so, over. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to ask you, does it exist? <laughs> right. uh, but we, when, when you're dealing, when, when poor people refuse to admit that they're poor people, that they are poor people, then there is no interdependence because you don't want anybody to know that your condition is really worse than what they're predicting it to be. This mm -hmm. is why these billionaires are making so much money on these clothes and all of these other, all this other foolishness of people who have nothing. You're, you're buying gym shoes with a link card. Come on, really? Uh, right. So the homelessness in some cases came because affordable housing is not. So when you get down on your luck, it's not as though you can go out and make a few dollars and at least keep your rent going. It's, it's every, the, the real estate market is way out of sight. Right. But then you have people who just plain choose not to come in. Yeah. They're done. They're, they don't want to be established with any responsibility ever again in life because mm -hmm. it was too much for them. I don't want to pay bills. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be responsible for mm -hmm. whole, uh, counting my money. Mm -hmm. I don't want these things because mm -hmm. these things to me uh, uh, make me uncomfortable because being responsible makes me uncomfortable. That's a dysfunction that goes back to some event in their life that right. make them just mm -hmm. give up. It could be abuse. It right. could be uh, one of many things. but. The main thing people are dealing with right now is a bad economy, mm -hmm. uh, imprisonment, mm -hmm. which has its, which is at record numbers. So people are coming out of prison mm -hmm. with nowhere to go, mm -hmm. right? Um, and basic family dysfunction. Right. And affordable housing is one of the keys because regentrification came into many of our communities mm -hmm. and forced a lot of our people out. Mm -hmm. um, rents at eight and nine hundred dollars, and you're already a working poor, so it's right. very difficult. And I know, you know, a lot of people were both parents are working two jobs just to keep at minimum the rent, wage. Right, at minimum wage, mm -hmm. just to keep the rent <coughs> paid and food on the table. Mm -hmm. And then you hear other people chattering about, you know, well, why are those kids out here? Well, mm -hmm. the parents are working two jobs mm -hmm. to keep the rent paid. Mm -hmm. So it's gotten just And expensive. again, that went back to my earlier comment with the extended family. If right. the kids were out and the parents were working, a lot of times the neighbor would say, come in, Jimmy, come in, mm -hmm. Sally, because your mother, I know your mother's at work and I know you haven't eaten, so come in and I'll take care. Right. And again, David has went back to love. The community love has been lost. Mm -hmm. With that, we're going to take a quick break. I want those of you at home to stay put. Uh, remember, this is a call-in show, so if you have questions, 
and I know we never ask questions about ourselves. It's always about people we know. So feel free to call in to ask the question about a person you know. I'm Stephanie Wilson Coleman, the Empowerment Doctor, and we will be right back. A bird sang this song to me. There was a message in his melody. Sweetest lyrics that I ever heard. There's a message in the song. Could you make it? We challenged 24 year old Paul Davis and college student Shante Hodnett to play spent. Place to live. Your mission survive on a low income without going broke, making tough choices that could leave you homeless. I'm really going to guess on this. I don't know the answer. Without warning, you can hit a dead end. I ran out of money. I had uh, to pay rent and did not have enough. It was difficult. I didn't think I was going to run out of money that quick. Jenny Nicholson created Spent as part of Urban Ministry of Durham, North Carolina. The game is based on Jenny's own experiences growing up in poverty. If somebody playing the game who's never experienced this kind of poverty before, at one point in the game goes, oh my gosh, this is hard. This is hard and this is painful and this is exhausting. That's, that's the emotion that, that I think we wanted to get across. How close are you? How would you answer these questions? Would you take a restaurant server job for two bucks an hour plus tips? A warehouse worker at nine dollars an hour. Beware, heavy lifting is involved. Or would you go for the temp job at nine dollars an hour? Heads up, most people fail the typing demands. Another question, do you opt in or out of health insurance? Do you rent close to work, which is more expensive, or do you live cheaper, further away? All of these life choices could leave you completely broke. In fact, 3.5 million Americans will experience homelessness this year. Many, like Denise Dickerson, never thought it would happen to them. For Denise, playing spent hit home. It's very realistic. It really is. Denise was able to rely on friends for a while, but her choices left her living in this homeless shelter for the past year. She hopes games like these will help others make better choices and help people understand what she is living through right now. Instead of looking down on us, um, to help us, don't, you know, we don't want a handout. We need a hand up. I'm Erica Washington reporting. Welcome back to A Sip of Inspiration. I'm Stephanie Wilson Coleman, the Empowerment Doctor, and tonight we are talking about homeless and invisible. Joining me back for the final segment of this show, of course, are my new, very best new friends, <laughs> the Reverend Dr. Stinson and David Pendleton. Thank you very much. Um, there was another bit of interesting statistics. Uh, there are Chicago reported having 1,329 emergency shelter beds available, mm -hmm. which is down 44% from 2,379 in 2011. And transitional housing beds are up a little bit. However, permanent supportive housing slots have only climbed slightly. So where everyone is asking, what's being done it's very little is being done. Mm -hmm. But while we were on break, we were having an interesting side conversation about how these people got from where they were, where they thought they were going, to where they are now. <laughs> <laughs> so share a little bit of your personal story. Wow. Um, as a child, I wanted to be a school teacher, mm -hmm. a nurse, um, set my path and my career and my college days on that and um, ended up at a place called Deborah's Place um, from a friend of mine who I met at the Paul at the college I was attending at Sai. <coughs> and she says, come on, I need you help to volunteer to help feed the homeless. Well, I was extremely gullible. So that's wonderful. I just want to help just like some of our people. And I, and when I got to Deborah's Place, they were on Cedric at that time, as overnight, um, I just, the Lord just said, this is where you're going to be. And I said, 
not me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to school. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be, a, you know, I'm going to have a, a career. Um, and I haven't looked back after 22 years come next, next month. I haven't looked back. Um, my passion for ministry also, I believe, is part of my driving force, mm -hmm. that I have a strong passion for ministry. And I, I love people. I generally love people. I love to be around them. I'm not the type of person that, that, that do not like people. And I think that even in ministry, we will find that there are people that just don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what about you? Well, uh, I don't know. When I was five years old, my mm -hmm. uncle Charles used to come by all the time, and he was a preacher. He's a pastor of uh, Greater Mount Vernon. And I said, I, when I grow up, I want to be a preacher so I can have a great green Cadillac and shiny shoes. <laughs> oh, cool. So I was motivated. Okay. Well, that dream went away. Um, and around 2003, I visited Oakdale Covenant Church and... Um, joined the church and the chairman of, of uh, Dora Pope Harry Thomas was telling him about the homeless shelter and the only thing I knew about homeless shelters was what I saw on TV so my mind was corrupt I had no clue but later that night I, I took his number because I, there was an interest something to do and uh, Daryl Jones Pastor Jones was was, was one of the associate pastors he was saying you know he was big on men's ministry and I was getting big on men's ministry because I saw the importance I told brother Harry uh, the Lord kind of gave me these words to make myself available to you for whatever it is you want. <laughs> Nine years later, I'm, 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 I'm serving God's people uh, because I made myself available. Um, there's a saying, don't concern yourself so much with your ability, mm -hmm. but certainly with your availability. Mm -hmm. And I think that because I, my heart is always available uh, in a way that my feet will never understand, um, it has made uh, this life serviceable for the cause of Christ amongst mm -hmm. these men mm -hmm. in a discipling way because they understand their lives are now mm -hmm. serviceable for the cause of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself as a servant. That's how I see myself. I'm a servant. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how I like to be seen. I am a servant. The difficult part sometimes is at being the executive director, not really want to be, not want to get on that floor and just sit and talk to the men and the women that come in and mm -hmm. just have a conversation with them. I don't get a chance to do a lot of that anymore, but that's where I'm comfortable at a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Tell me, talk to Dr. Sonia, talk to her, just, just talk. And I, I think that's why I continue to live in the community that Matthew House is so that they will know that I'm just not an executive director or um, who's going to another place, but I know your plight, I see you. I can see you on through the night and what you're doing. So I consider myself a servant of God. Now, um, I think one of the uh, part of the questions that was asked earlier was, we said we covered the how does it happen? People, listeners at home, it just doesn't happen.